Okay, so continuing. Uh, let's see here. Bible verses on Halloween. Let's just look at some of these. Okay, just to, you know, just to read some things about you know the Halloween that that we would want to uh, we would want to go into further here. The Bible says to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather to reprove them. Okay, so this is something that what we're doing today, we're reproving the unfruitful works of darkness, because a lot of times people say, well, why do, you, why do you major so much in all this witchcraft stuff? Well, one of the reasons is, is because nobody else is doing it. Or very few other ministries are doing this. You know, I, I really think that they're afraid to confront this type of stuff. I, I have no idea why they would be afraid. The Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I can do all things through Christ which strengthen me. I mean, there, there's all these promises to the believer in Christ that far outweigh anything that witchcraft can bring to the table. Okay, so, you know, this is our battle that we're really called to. And remember, all of this boils down to a spiritual battle. This is something that, yeah, we could focus on the witches and the warlocks and all their stuff, but it's the demons and the devils and the fallen angels that are behind this stuff that we really need to direct our prayers and our warfare to, okay, in regard to prayer and these types of things, praying and fasting. Um, the Bible says that in, in 1 Thessalonians 5.22, to abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay, now, when you're participating in Halloween, how do you do that? Let, let, let me know that one. How do you abstain from all appearance of evil and participate in Halloween? Well, it's just good, innocent fun. Come on now, why can't you lighten up? You're always throwing a wet blanket on everything there, uh, Scott. Well, sorry. If we go further, Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. Now, we, we read this last week. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer, ones that talk to the supposedly the dead. For all the for all that do these things are an abomination of the Lord, because of these, these abominations the Lord thy God both driveth them out before thee. This scriptural injunction in Deuteronomy 18 strictly forbade the people of Israel from having anything to do with the satanic practices of their Canaanite neighbors. This is a scriptural principle for us to follow. And again, how do you, how do you obey, how do you flee all appearance of evil, how do you abstain from all appearance of evil? How do you how do you do all these things and participate in Halloween at the same time? It, it just can't be done. Halloween is for many a crossover involvement in which innocent games can be can lead to serious entanglement with real witches, neo pagans, new agers, and other cultists. In other words, Halloween is like the ultimate recruitment night for witchcraft. If you think about it, you could have the 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 best not the best, but let's say your average Christian family, who, let's say they try to do their best during the year, and they're going to their 501c3 lukewarm church, and they're this and then that, and they're not getting fed any kind of real truth. And they celebrate Halloween every year. Do you understand that's an open door for Satan to come in and ultimately bring them down a road which leads them to much more heinous things? Okay, this is a doorway that gets open, and it's also a recruitment tool, tool by Satan to draw you into things of the occult and, and to make them look like they're harmless at the same time. Oh, it's just harmless fun. You know, these types of things. A common pastime is to use Ouija boards in an attempt to contact ghosts or spirits that are believed to be roaming about. Now, remember what I said. How, uh, October 31st is... Most likely, from a spiritual standpoint, where the veil between the spirit world is at its thinnest. The occultists just don't celebrate it on this particular day because there's no benefit. There's real reasons they do this stuff. It may be wicked and corrupt and warped reasons, but there's real reasons they do this stuff. So, if you use a Ouija board on that night, you're probably going to have the highest success night of the whole year of getting 
a response. And I'm telling you, on all these shows where they have like these possession shows where like the houses become haunted and, and these, these investigative reports and things like that, so much of the time, if you wa- if you ever do a watch any of those shows, many times the house that they're in is fine. They use a Ouija board one night and from that point forward it's haunted. Well why did that happen? Because you opened a door with the Ouija board. Those Ouija boards are from the pit of hell. If you know, if you have any, if you know of anyone that has one, try to get that thing burned as quick as you can. Because they are from the pit of hell. I'm telling you, they are so dangerous. There's many witches that don't even mess with Ouija boards. Because they know all the bad things that can happen if you use those. So, this can lead to serious consequences, including demon possession as well. Demons have a vested interest in Halloween because it supports the occult. And it also offers novel and unexpected opportunities to control and influence people. And again, not to mention all the churches profit in selling pumpkins. They're selling their pumpkins so that people can make jack-o'-lanterns. Now, I don't have a problem with pumpkin pie, okay? I got a problem with that. But when it comes to pumpkins, the main reason that they're being sold during this time of year is not for pumpkin pie, but for Halloween. So you can carve these things. What a waste of money, too. Do you know the millions and millions and millions that are made every year on all these occult holidays, Halloween being one of the highest ones, in costumes, costume rentals, you got the you got the lanterns you got all the candy that's being bought. And all of it's wicked. Every bit of it. The only thing that I think a Christian should should potentially do on Halloween is um, use it as a track ministry. I think that's a great night for that because you can actually get the gospel out and uh, to, to uh, children that would might not ever Chick Track has some great tracks for kids, okay? But I'm not saying dress up and do all this other junk. But I'm just saying it's probably the best night of the year as far as a potential ministry for that goes. Um, Forms of the occult can include mediums, channelers, clairvoyants, psychics, spiritualists, diviners, mystics, gurus, shamans, uh, cyclical researchers, yogis, psychic healers, astral travel, astrology, mysticism, Ouija boards, tarot cards, contact with the dead, and thousands thousands of other uh, practices that almost defy categorizing. Now, Leviticus 19.31 says, Regard not them that have familiar spirits. Neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. Because, see, when you go to a psychic, or when you go to, like, Saladin, the witch of Endor, who had a familiar spirit, which is what psychics work through. They, they work through spirits that communicate with them, that feed them inside information. Much of the time the information's wrong, but they feed them information that then the psychic puts back out, and the person thinks, oh, wow, she's so whatever. And that's how they make their money. But the Bible says, regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards, which are, wizards would be more particularly a male witch. Because then what does it say? It says, to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. See, when you go to these people, when you participate in these practices, you are becoming defiled. Now, if you're a born-again Christian, the Bible says the Holy Spirit lives inside you. You're the temple of the Holy Ghost. And it says, defile not the temple. Okay, so you have no right as a Christian to to, to be messing around with this junk. Acts 19, verses 18 and 19 says, And many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Now these are many people that just got saved out of a pagan lifestyle. Many of them also, which used curious arts, brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found that it was 50,000 pieces of silver. Well, these people were participating in some serious witchcraft. And this is why there's hope for witches. Okay? Because here in the Bible, in Acts 19, I mean, a ton of people got saved. But what was the first thing they did? They confessed and they showed their deeds. In other words, they confessed that they were involved in this stuff. They, they, they did this. And then they brought their curious arts. Curious arts, is in that regard, is, is witchcraft. Whatever books they had, whatever things they had to conjure, do whatever they were going to do, whatever talismans they may have had, or whatever they were using, they brought these things together, and what did they do? Did they throw them in the trash? So they threw them in the trash, and the trashman came and gone, gathered them up, and took them away. No, it says they burned them. I always advise, whenever you have anything that's wicked, to burn it. 
Don't just throw it in the trash. Burn it. Why? Because there's a spiritual, demonic entity associated with that cursed object. And if it's in your house, just because you put it in the trash, you haven't done anything to actually deal with the curse. When you burn something like this, there's a spiritual dynamic that takes place that liberates, that, that, that it's almost like it's breaking the curse. Okay? Because demons don't like fire. Okay, now, I've heard occultists go into this further, uh, where, you know, they would actually give that reason that they do not like fire. And when you burn something like this, you're actually, it's like breaking a curse. Okay? So, I'm telling you, burn it, if at all possible, burn it. Um, this little excerpt also says, it's my conviction that a true Bible loving Christian should not be part of the evils and the wickedness of satanic things. We must realize that Halloween is the devil's birthday. On that day, Halloween, October 31st, the witches and saint worshippers uh, offer human sacrifices by slaying a child or whatever other thing they're going to use. I'm not saying they're always going to have a child at their disposal, but I'm telling you that's the highest human sacrifice that there is. Uh, we seek to enlighten people about the satanic origins and practices of Halloween. Now, Aleister Crowley said that many times. Aleister Crowley, who was reputed to be the most wickedest man on earth, he said that the highest... He wrote about this, I believe, in the book of the law that he wrote, Thelma. He said that the highest sacrifice that, that uh, you can uh, you can offer as a Satanist is a uh, small infant boy child. And he bragged about things that he did to little boys that aren't even really appropriate to repeat. But that's how he practiced his religion. And I'm telling you, if you're debased enough, and you're far enough into the dark arts, Satan will require the same thing from you as he did from Aleister Crowley. He's no different. He's not special in any way, shape, or form. That's it. So if we go a little bit further, the Bible also says in Psalm 66, verse 18, that if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Well, let me ask you a question is this. If you're a Christian celebrating Halloween, you're regarding iniquity, which is sin in your heart. Well, do you think it might maybe hinder your prayers if you're, like, you're celebrating Halloween and going out and doing the pumpkin thing and all this other stuff? Um, this little excerpt is from the Last Trumpet Ministries, and... I'm just going to read this. It says, With Halloween, the witch's sabbat of Samhain... Now, he was a former witch, the guy that wrote, writes uh, Last Trumpet. He's a born-again Christian pastor now. But uh, He says, With Halloween, the witch's sabbat of Samhain, now upon us, witchcraft in the churches really becomes visible. The latest craze among nominal Christians is the jesus o lantern Oh, yeah. They've got the jesus o lantern now. Okay, like the jack-o'-lantern? The Jesus o lantern, which is a hollowed out pumpkin with a face of Jesus etched into it. Oh yeah. It is done by taking a picture of a picture of what is supposed to be Jesus. And again, I've done whole teachings where these pictures we see of Jesus are not Jesus. Re listen to the uh, teaching on uh, Lord Maitreya and the Ascended Masters. Okay, if you want to know more about that. And then using the negative of this picture of su the supposed Jesus by taping it onto the pumpkin. The white areas are etched into the surface of the pumpkin. The children are also instructed to take the negative and stare at it for 30 seconds and then close their eyes. And then look at the white wall and they'll see the face of Jesus on the wall. If that's not mind control, satanic stuff, I don't really know what is. And again, we've seen what the original use... The original traditional use of jack-o'-lanterns were, which was the symbol of a damn soul, which is what they put in front of the house, filled with human fat, with a grotesque face carved on it, to protect the inhabitants of the house that night, if you got the treat from the Druid High Priest, for giving a human sacrifice that night. That's where we have, and again, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I don't care, you can put any kind of veneer on it that you want. It's wicked! We know that Halloween is strictly witchcraft and has nothing to do with Christianity at all. Why has Dr. James Dobson's Focus on the Family Organization recently aired a radio program featuring two women who are promoting Halloween as a Christian holiday? 
Yeah, good old James Dobson right down the line, hardcore, preaching against the 501c3 church. King James only, James Dobson. Of course, all that was just a lie that I just said. Just to kind of be sarcastic there a little bit. Yeah, he had two women. Two women. I'm sure they're submissive to their husband, too. Two women who are promoting Halloween as Christian holidays. They're, they're probably pastors. Women pastors. These women are promoting Halloween and All Saints Day by connecting it to the Christian martyrs. Isn't that what the Catholic Church did back in the Middle Ages? Did, isn't this the whole reason that we did this teaching today? So, why did they do it? Well, then we can amalgamate the two. We can kind of connect one to the other. Because, you know... It was the eve of a holy day. That's what the word Halloween means. It was the eve of All Saints Day. So we could try to put this Christian pseudo-pagan veneer on it and, and make it all good. And we can have our harvest festivals and we can sell our pumpkins and we can do all this wickedness and we can put some kind of Christian veneer on it. See, Satan's good at what he does. Okay? I mean, I don't want to give more devil, more due than the devil deserves, but, you know... He's had thousands of years to hone and perfect his craft. He was, he was the most highest, uh, essentially, ranking cherub in, the, uh, in heaven before he fell. So if we go further, it says, the, they are saying that Christians should give out the biggest candy bars and best treats and thus reclaim Halloween for Christianity. Reclaim it! I never knew we had it. But you know what? I just learned, I, I just, it just popped in my head. We just all need to lighten up, don't we, Doug? We really do. No, Ned, I think we need to just lighten up. I think we're just fuddy-duddies, is all it boils down to. Fuddy-duddies. Yeah, but we need to reclaim it. Well, the thing is, is we never had it. How can you reclaim something you never had? It, it, it shouldn't have ever had anything to do with anything of a Christian nature other than condemning it and reproving it. But we need to reclaim it. Much could be said about this, but suffice it to say that Halloween was invented by witches at the behest of Satan himself. And this is coming from a witch saying this. And the original meaning of a jack-o'-lantern, which was the illuminated, which was illuminated with a candle made from human tallow or fat, was to show the cooperation with the Dru Druid witches in England. So he just confirms that. This is another witch saying this. The the oh, and just so you know, the information that I told you about with Halloween was from a high-level Luciferian Satanist, Doc Marquis. And now we've got another witch saying the same thing. And if, if you research the occult, you can get confirmation after confirmation of this. Now, again, if you're going to find out the meaning of Halloween, of a pagan holiday, wouldn't it make sense to like go to pagan sources to find out what the holiday originally meant and what it originally came from? Now, a lot of pagans may deny it. Oh, no, this didn't really happen because they don't want they, they, they to be exposed. But I'm telling you, this is easy to find, this information. It's not hard. These witches held a human sacrifice ritual at Stonehenge in England on October 31st, involving a huge bone fire, later called a bonfire. Again, doesn't this just confirm what we all just said? From a separate witch, who's now a born-again Christian, that came out of it. Doc Marquis is also a born-again Christian, who was a high-level Luciferian. I think that's a... Now, if you were going to listen to somebody, I mean, if, if I never had any occult background and I came out and I was saying all this stuff as a born-again Christian, well, yeah, I'm not saying that, that you could say I hadn't done my homework. But imagine if you had actually been there and done it and experienced it and lived it. Well, that would have a lot more validity. I think you would put a lot more credence on what they were saying. Well, these are guys that came out of it. Jeremiah 10.2 warns us to not to learn the way of the heathen. Okay, so now let's go further. Now, I just, when I was speaking up at um, Indianapolis Baptist Temple, at a conference in, in Indianapolis, oh, three or four years ago, I was in my hotel room, and I had picked up a Christian little periodical paper up there, you know, the, the weekly Christian periodicals, and I found this hardcore, right down the line, article, written by a Baptist pastor, Pastor Dennis Clark, pastor of Pendleton Baptist Church. I'll give his email address at the end so you can email him. I'm sure you might want to after you read this. This is from the IndianaChristianNews.com, October of 2004. Okay, so this was a few years ago, but it's still, it's still just as apropos today. You're going to love this. And now, I, I save this for last, because isn't that what we should always do? Don't you always save the best for last? Well, that's what we're going to do today. 
So the Christian, it's, it's entitled The Christian and Halloween by Pastor Dennis Clark. Oh, this gets me really fired up, this one. Now, I'm not going to read this whole thing because it's, it's basically pure abominable drivel. Okay, if I could summarize what we're going to be reading here. But it's really, really super easy to refute. Makes my job pretty simple, especially in light of everything that we just talked about. This pastor, this is like into the thing, and this is under his history of Halloween. Does Halloween's speckled and sometimes sinister past have anything bearing, have any bearing on our decision as Christians to participate in or abstain from its traditional customs? Okay, so this is the question that he's posed. Does it sinister past? Should it, you know, should it, should it, uh, hinder us, you know, in any way? He says, the answer is yes and no. Ah, spoken like a true lukewarm Laodicean hireling in wolf in sheep's clothing. The answer is yes and no. If the celebration of Halloween promotes the false ideas rooted in its origin, Christians must take a hands-off position. Well, I wish he would have went with that thought, but no, 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 no. He's not going to go with that thought. Oh, no. Uh-uh. So let me just read that again. If the celebration of Halloween promotes the, the false ideas rooted in its origin, Christians must take a hands-off position. However, if the contemporary practices do not glorify its history, it is possible to participate without tarnishing the biblical truths Christians hold so dear. Ah, you gotta love this guy. He's right down the line. Wow, you know, Pastor, a lot of verses just popped into my head. What do you do with these verses, Pastor, if I could have this guy right in front of me? What about where it says in the Bible to have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but to rather reprove them? What about that little verse? The little, little problem with what you just said there, Pastor? What about that verse, Pastor, where it says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Leaven is always a type of sin. We're, and then it says we're to purge out the old leaven that the whole lump may be made new. No, we don't want to do that though, do we, Pastor? No, we just kind of want to, you know. What about that verse, Pastor, in 2 Corinthians 6.14, where it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what communion hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and Christ with Belial, which is the devil? Well, when you participate in Halloween, isn't that what you're doing? Aren't you yoking yourself up as a born-again Christian with Belial, the devil? Well, hey, it's his birthday. What about that verse, Pastor? Then it says, For ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost. Huh. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and you'll be, I will be a father to you, and, I, and you will be as to me children. So, how do we do that and participate in Halloween? What about Proverbs 14.12 and 16.25 where it says, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. In Jeremiah 17.9, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Well, I'll tell you what, if you're a born-again Christian participating in Halloween, your heart has deceived you. And the Bible says in Proverbs 28 verse 26 that he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. That's what, the, that's what God thinks about the heart. Okay? And you know what this is? This is an absolute confirmation of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I know I've said that. Let's just read that real quick. Okay, so talking about Christ's return here, verse 3, let no man, this is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first. Jesus Christ returning shall not come. Before there comes a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. It says there's a falling away that's going to come first before Christ comes, and that the man of sin will be revealed. Most likely, the, when the man of sin is going to be revealed, is going to be at the start of the tribulation. When he is going to confirm the covenant with Israel for a week, which is seven years, and that's going to start the seven year, year reign of the Antichrist. Okay? So let's go down a little bit further. Verse 
Verse 9, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, and we're talking about the Antichrist here, with all power, lying signs, and wonders. Okay, this is what's going to happen. A lot of lying signs and wonders. If it were possible, even that they shall deceive the very elect. Okay? And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Now listen here. This is why I said this. Because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. How do you get saved? You've got to receive the love of the truth. The Bible says, Jesus said, If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Continuing in his word is uh, very, very important in order to be truly set free. You just don't get, you know, say some little prayer, say you're saved, and go on living like the devil. That's not evidence that you were ever saved, is what I'm trying to say. But it says right here, it says, Because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. See, God's going to be the one that sends this strong delusion. He's the one that's permitting this to happen. It says He's the one that's actually sending it. Hasn't He many, many times in the Bible used, used Satan to do his, in a way, His will? I mean, I'm not saying that, that you know Him and Satan are conspiring, but I'm saying He's like a useful idiot, almost, in God's eyes. I'm not calling Satan an idiot. I'm just saying, in God's eyes... He has used Satan in that regard on numerous occasions. Or, or, or demonic entities, these types of things. Verse 12. That they might all be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Well, when you participate in Halloween, and you say it's no big deal, and this types of thing, is that like kind of like having pleasure in unrighteousness? And, and what does that pleasure in unrighteousness ev evolve around? Believing not the truth. This obvious truth that we're talking about today with Halloween. Oh, you're just a big legalist. That's all you are. I'm so sick of people like you. You think you're better. No, I don't. The only thing I'm worthy of is hell. Apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. I've said that before and I mean it. Okay? This isn't about Mr. Scott or whatever, thinking he's smarter than everybody. This is about obvious things that we can look at... But like the Bible says, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. I mean, this is just so flagrantly obvious. I mean, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of topics I cover that are a lot more challenging than this. This is like the easiest one of all the things I could to cover. And yet, Christians still don't, oh no, he's, he's just a legalist, or, or, or he's, he's all bound up. We, we, we have liberty, brother. Should we sin that grace may be abound then? So let's go back to this wonderful article. Let's just, I'll pick up with this sentence before I left off. However, if the contemporary practices of Halloween do not glorify its history, it is possible to participate without tarnishing the biblical truth. How, you're telling me then, dressing up in costumes, getting the, getting the jack-o'-lanterns, of course if you're a church you have the Jesus O'Lantern, um, doing all these things that are associated with wickedness, watching horror movies, d seances, and all this other stuff, you're telling me that doesn't glorify Halloween's true history? Of course it does. But it says, if the contemporary practices do not glorify its history, well, that's, a, that's an asinine statement. Obviously it glorifies its history. But then it's possible to participate without tarnishing the biblical truths Christians hold so dear. So the real question is, this is from this pastor, is what does Halloween mean today? Is it, celebrate, is it a celebration of Satan and demons? Does it desensitize us? Making us more susceptible to the occult? Certainly not! Oh, hold on, hold on, I, I, I skipped the question. So let's, let's go through all these questions again. Does Hall what is Halloween today? Is it a celebration of Satan and his demons? Question one. Does it desensitize us, making us more susceptible to the occult? Question number two. Does Halloween have a cultish grip on America? Question number three. Certainly not, is what this good, right down the line, Baptist preacher says. Certainly not. It is generally viewed as a day for children to have fun and merchants to make a profit. Oh, that sounds really biblical. Fun and making a profit. Wow! All in the name of Satan! Isn't this great?
let's go further. So in his last, he, he ends this, and I'm not going to read this whole thing, but he ends it by saying, why discuss Halloween and Christians? Why discuss it? But he's going to go ahead and throw us a bone and, and, and give us his take on everything. Why discuss Halloween and Christians? So what? What's so important about a Christian's view of Halloween? Aren't there more crucial subjects to tackle? Yes, there are. Wow, I guess Halloween, October 31st, Satan's birthday, highest night of human sacrifice, highest night on the pagan calendar, all of the wickedness that goes on. I guess, you know, there are a lot of other things that are way more important that we would, we would want to tackle. You know, I, I can see that. When, 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 you know, what do you think? I mean, you know, we, we probably should be talking about maybe toning it down a little bit with our Christian rock concerts. Maybe we, we might want to tone that. That's a more important subject. You know, or, or something like that. But I, I think, you know, I, I really think this pastor's swaying me at this point. I, I, really, I don't know about you guys, but I, I'm, getting, I'm getting swayed. I'm getting, he's so good at what he does. So he says, yes, there are. There's more important subjects. But before dismissing this topic completely... Oh, well, I'm glad he's going to give us this little morsel. But before dismissing this topic completely, consider one possible danger. It's just a possible one. It's not a real valid, maybe it's possible. Consider this one possible danger facing Christians who adamantly oppose the Halloween customs. Hmm, those bad Christians who adamantly oppose this. They're legalists. Such convictions run a risk of detracting both parents and children from the real evil of the satanic world system. Well, oh, you know, I'm totally swayed now. Can you believe this? You know, I just, I really just pray that these lukewarm, pathetic, spineless, sold-out hirelings, that the fear of God would rest on them like a thick cloud, that they'd be exposed, that all men would see and fear and declare the work of God, like Psalm 64 talks about. That they would be judged in this life that there might be a hope for them to even get saved. And if they can't get saved, if they're of Satan, if they're, if they're a minister of Satan posing as a minister of righteousness... If they're a tear among wheat, and I think many of them and most of them are, that God would judge them in this lifetime, that all men would see and fear and declare the work of God, that great fear would fall on Christians because they're following men that are saying Halloween's okay, like this pastor. Cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and that maketh flesh his arm, whose heart departed from the Lord. Jeremiah 17, 9. Cursed be the man that trusteth the man. If your pastor's telling you this is okay, or not mentioning it at all, what's that called? The sin of silence? Why isn't he warning you about this? Well, he doesn't want to offend. Oh, isn't that special? That's so wonderful. He'd rather see you go to hell and burn than offend you. I'm not saying that this is, I'm not talking about, well, now we're talking about salvation. But I'm telling you, if you're, if you're participating in Halloween, and you don't see anything wrong with it, and there's no conviction of the Holy Ghost, then you're probably not even saved. Because the Holy Ghost lives inside you. The Bible says, whom the Lord loveth, he also chasteneth. And if you be without chastisement, you're bastards. Chastening means to get a spanking from God, essentially. And if you don't get chastened, if you're doing this stuff as a Christian and there's no repercussions, and you don't have any convictions, you're not saved. How could the Holy Spirit live inside you and not convict you about any of your sin? How is that possible? It doesn't make any biblical sense at all. So, he, he tells us that the... You know, if, if, we, if we're adamantly opposing these Halloween customs, we run a risk of distracting both the parents and children from the real evil of the satanic world system. As, as though this is not part of the real evil of the satanic world system. I can't think of a better example of the real evil of the satanic world system than Halloween. I don't know of a better example. 
you got everything here. You got human sacrifice. You got the most highest wicked night of the year. You got the you got the night of the year where the veil between the spirit worlds are at its thinnest. It doesn't get any worse than this. But again, I just need to lighten up. Sorry. I need to take a chill pill and lighten up, right? I'm just a legalist. The Apostle Paul said, and no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Oh, isn't it ironic that he of all people would quote this verse? See, this man indicts himself more than any other pastor I have ever read anything about. Now, I'm not saying there's other ones that couldn't compare. But he, he is such... This man is so filled with malignity and hypocrisy in lying and deceivableness. I should I mean really, you know, he calls himself a pastor. He's not a pastor. He's not biblically qualified to be a pastor. There's certain biblical qualifications you have to have to be a pastor. He's disqualified himself just from writing this one article. He has no discernment at all. Obviously. And why would you want somebody with no discernment leading the flock? I just can't quite see it myself. So he quotes this verse, the Apostle Paul, And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed into ministers of righteousness. The only thing he did right is quote from the King James Bible. That's 2 Corinthians 11, 14-50. But isn't it ironic, this is an absolute indictment of this very man, and he uses that very verse to quote? It's like, I'm just Unbelievable. And then, he, and then he goes on to say, Satan and his demons are busy perverting the gospel. I have no problem with that. They're doing it through the false Bible versions. And false preachers, preaching feel-good gospel. Satan and his demons are busy perverting the gospel through false teachers. He being one of the chief. You know? The liberal pastor who denies the verbal inspiration of the Bible, is a pawn of Satan. As he, as though he is not a liberal pastor. You talk about a lukewarm... This guy's justifying the most wicked night of the year, and what is he calling himself? Hardcore? Conservative? Biblical? Right down the line? I don't think so. It's, the hypocrisy is just almost incomprehensible. He himself is trying to indict false teachers and liberal pastors, and his very own tongue condemns himself to be the very thing that he's condemning. He says here, the liberal pastor who denies the verbal inspiration of the Bible is the pawn of Satan. Yet this pastor probably sees no difference in Bible versions. I will say that he did quote the King James, but I don't see anything else where he's actually promoting it. I'll give him the benefit of the doubt on that one. The Christian organization that can promise biblical principles does more damage to the Christian family than the vivid imagination of a young child who conjures up images of costumes and candy on Halloween night. Is this... Am I... Is this insanity? You, you almost... It's almost hard to do a commentary on this because it's so paradoxical. It's so full of hypocrisy and lies and flip-flopping. Let's read that again. The Christian organization that compromises biblical principles does more damage to the Christian family than the vivid image of a young child who conjures up images of costumes and candy on Halloween night. Let's really look at what he's saying there. Okay, so he's saying a Christian organization that can promise his biblical principles does more damage to the Christian family than the vivid imagination of a young child who conjures up images of costumes and candy. So in other words, it does more damage. The child who conjures up images of costumes and candies on Halloween night is still doing damage, though. That's what this implies. But the, but the Christian organization that can promise his biblical principles does more damage than that. So it's just a matter of degrees of damage. Should we sin that grace may, be a, may abound? It's as though, yeah, we're doing damage, but the Christian one that... Well, hold on. If you're a church, and you're bringing this 
satanic holiday and embracing the satanic holiday in your church, is that not compromising biblical principles? Haven't we just given you a boatload of Bible quotes saying that that is the ultimate in compromise? It, it, this is just unbelievable. Is this lukewarm pastor stance on Halloween not the height of compromising biblical principles? Let's 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 term it that way. Then he goes on to say, our adversary is not interested in looking like an elderly green skinned woman. <laughs> With a pointed hat riding on a kitchen broom. Our yeah, he you know, he again his logic just prevails over me. Rather, he desires to mimic a teacher of righteousness by which he deceives an unregenerate world, condemning them to their own lost condition. I couldn't have said it better myself, Pastor. You're right, Pastor. Satan does most highly desire to mimic a teacher of righteousness, like yourself, because your own tongue condemns you, which deceives an unregenerate world, condemning them to their lost condition. Is this, this is exactly what this pastor is doing. He's mimicking a teacher of righteousness. He's giving us leaven. He's giving us doctrine that has been totally leavened. So he says our adversary is not interested in looking like an elderly green-skinned woman with a pointed hat right on a, on a kitchen broom. Oh, he's not. Oh, as though he speaks for Satan. He's Satan's mouthpiece now. It's as though he's, he's, he knows all of these deep, deep, deep spiritual truths. You know what? Satan wants to get in the door any way he can. He's very interested in looking like a green-skinned woman on a broom or, or, some, or some whatever person dressed up in a costume. If that's how he can get in the door and get you to lower your defenses, which is exactly what Halloween does, what, if you think about it, what does Halloween do in its essence to worst-case scenario to a Christian? It gets you to lower your defenses to say, oh, it's this harmless little thing. They're just dressed up. They're just having fun. They're just playing around. It's one of the most subtle... In a way, it's not subtle. In a way, it's like, if we go back a hundred years ago, I think it's like, nobody would have anything to do with this. But we're so undiscerning in today's day and age, as whether, whether you call yourself a Christian or a non-Christian, most people are so undiscerning, they see no difference. Oh, it's no big deal. By this man writing this, it's, it's as if this man is almost unknowingly condemning himself with his, own, with his own words. He's condemning himself with his own words. I mean, every sentence I read here is a new level of hypocrisy. Let's go further. As Christians, we must maintain a biblical perspective on evil. I agree, Pastor. I totally agree. In fact, that's why I'm ripping apart this pathetic, lukewarm commentary. You are my example of Christians not maintaining a biblical, biblical perspective on evil. You are the quintessential essence of a Christian not maintaining any kind of biblical standard on evil. You are the quintessential essence of a Christian lowering his guard to Satan and calling evil good and good evil. The Bible says, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put sweet for bitter and bitter for sweet. That put light for darkness and darkness for light. Isn't that what he's doing? As a Christian, we must maintain a biblical perspective on evil and how it operates in our universe. It is easy to spend our energies fighting the wrong enemy, though. Oh, evidently this is nothing to be concerned about, this whole thing that we just talked about today on Halloween. And again, like I said, he just continues to indict himself and to condemn himself with his own mouth, with his own tongue. The Bible says, by your words you will be justified, and by your words you are also going to be condemned. Well, he's doing a boatload to condemn himself. If he makes it to the judgment seat of Christ, I don't think he's on his way to the judgment seat of Christ. I think he's on his way to the great white throne judgment. I don't think this man's saved. I think he's a wolf in sheep's clothing, a hireling. 
if the Holy Spirit lived inside this pastor, why isn't he convicting him about this? Why, why, why could, how could this man operate in, in such a level of depravity and deception and put it out with a smile on his face and have no conviction of it? How could that be? You know, I don't know. I hope he is saved, but I tell you what, he needs to get right with the Lord. The Bible also says, by their fruit you shall know them. What if, have you seen some fruit from this pastor today, from his mouth? Fruit of his words? This is, I read this because this is a great example of the hypocrisy, the lukewarmness that's going on in the modern day church today. And it, it's good to arm yourself with this type of knowledge. So he, he concludes here, thank God, he concludes by saying, what should a Christian parent do then? There is a biblical liberty in this matter. <laughs> oh yeah. Should we sin that grace may abound? That's, that's a, pretty much that uh, use not your liberty, the Bible says, for an occasion to the flesh. Well, if Halloween isn't an occasion to the flesh, I don't know really what is. I guess I just am a fuddy-duddy because I don't know what is if Halloween's not. It's the ultimate occasion to the flesh. But this pastor says there is a biblical liberty in this matter. Some will feel more comfortable backing away from Halloween traditions. Oh. See, it's all about how you feel. Your heart, like what we talked about before. Others will enter into them, these Halloween activities, as a family activity. Both need to be tolerant of one another. We need to be tolerant. This guy, this guy should, should be like the chaplain for the United Nations. He'd make a great chaplain for the United Nations. He could be tolerant of everybody. Now listen how he ends it. This is a real hallmark moment here coming up. Hallmark moment coming up right now. Tearjerker. I'm warning you. Don't get all teary-eyed on me. As for me, this is this pastor, this stalwart of the faith. As for me, I will be making sure the porch light is on. The treats are ready. Waiting for the knock on the door and the giggles which follow when our four grandchildren come to say, Trick or treat, Grandpa. End of article. <laughs> yeah, this guy's name's Dennis Clark, pastor of Pendleton Baptist Church. Email address, dkclark7. D is in dog. K, uh, D-K-C-L-A-R- K7 at Juno.com. Now, this was four years ago or three years ago, so I don't know if we'll still have it. But um, you notice he never even mentioned track passing. He's not even incorporating that into anything. He is so immersed in the world that that's not even something that he even. He, I, I never heard him say to flee all appearance of evil. I, I, I just. Never heard him talk about that I was setting a wicked thing before my eyes. No, none of that was really mentioned. I don't know if you heard it. Maybe I just skimmed over it. Now, concluding this, ask yourself the question. Would you, as Satan, let's put yourself in Satan's shoes, or put yourself in the shoes of a witch. If you were a witch, or you were Satan, and you read this article, would you approve or disapprove of what we just read? As a Satanist. Or which? What do you think? I think you would say, Oh, yes, way to go. Good job there, Pastor. You really hit it on the head. You are advancing Satan's kingdom like you wouldn't believe. You're a pawn of Satan and you don't even know it. At least I'm like a Satanist. At least they're the real deal. At least they're honest about what they do. He's not even, he doesn't even have that benefit. I believe he's worse in God's eyes than a witch or Satanist. I really do. I truly believe that. Okay, so let, let's let's do let's let's go a little further. Let's take away the, the being a witch or Satanist. What if you were God reading this article? Would you approve or disapprove of it then? What do you think? 
I mean, you don't have to have the discernment of a dung beetle to know that God would find this highly offensive and a total abomination. And the reason, in essence, the church is in the shape that it's in. No discernment, no understanding, no wisdom, no fear of God, no humility. As Jesus commanded us over and over again, especially regarding the end times, be not deceived. And if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. And that the Antichrist is going to come with all lying signs and wonders. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their consciences seared with a hot iron. 1 Timothy 4.1. Isn't that what we just talked about today? The, the, the latter times? Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils? Isn't that what we just read about? Isn't that what Halloween is all about? Speaking lies and hypocrisy? Isn't that what we just read from this good pastor? Lies? Having their conscience sincere with a hot iron. This man can write this drivel. He can write this abominable heresy. And his conscience isn't affected one bit. His conscience has been seared with a hot iron. He's taken over. This man's probably possessed, and he doesn't even know it. Other than that, I'm pretty neutral on the subject. I don't know. I, 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 I'm sorry. I, I know I got a little fired up today. Uh, that's part one of our, of our uh, teaching. Actually, I might split this into two parts. Uh, yeah, this will probably be the end of part two. Um, and we're going to go to uh, part three in a second.